my name's Alicia, and I am a community group leader, and I serve on the prayer team. Hi. Tonight's teaching text is from Luke 5, verses 15 to 16. It says, yet the news about him spread all the more, so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. This is the word of the Lord. John Ortberg says this, anytime you see life flourishing, it is because it's receiving nourishment from outside of itself. What's helping you be nourished? What are you feasting on? What are you drawing on so that you can flourish? We have to figure this out because we live in a very public world these days. Most of our lives is defined by our public presence and we all need fuel to maintain our public presence. I grew up in the late 1900s and <laughs> I remember very, very clearly being anonymous. You could just, half the fun was finding your friends you couldn't reach. Not anymore, our lives are all in public and that means there's pressure on our public performance. My gosh, a middle school girl posting a photo on Instagram has to worry about how many likes she gets for her dinner. Everything's in public. There is pressure for how we perform in the public place. New York is a very public place. New York is driven by how well you do up front. New York doesn't care what it takes or what you use to fuel yourself as long as you show up and win in the public place. Here is the burnout cycle that is the result of living in such a public time in history. It starts with a sense of ambition, and it's followed by drive, and it ultimately leads to exhaustion. New York is like the NFL of the human, uh, human race. I used to be a youth pastor in Dallas, Texas, in a city called Garland when I was in Bible college. And my team, I was living Friday Night Lights. Some of you watched it, I lived it. Our local team won the, the Texas State 5A high school championships. These guys just treated like gods until they got to college and realized that college football is filled with gods. And you go from college football into the NFL and you realize that the NFL is filled with college gods. The pressure, the pressure, the pressure, the pressure. You get to New York, you got to perform in public and you're really good at where you're from. And uh, you come here and it's like, wow, everybody's got a master's degree from MIT. Okay, touch harder than I thought. Pressure to perform in public and it's very, very hard for people. So people try and figure out how they can nourish themselves so they can thrive. New York has a false cycle. False cycle. Here's what it is. Ambition, escape, and numbing. That's what happens. You got ambition, and then you're like, mate, this is killing me. I've got to escape from this. And what you do in your downtime is you numb so you can get back to your ambition. And this goes on and on and on over the course of time until you burn out. New York is the only city I know that when you get serious about staying, you buy a house outside of the city and not in the city. <laughs> when people say, we just bought a place upstate, I'm like, fantastic, you're gonna be here another 20 years. People buy places outside the city to sustain their life in the city, it's wild. But then what do they do when they finally build that rhythm of getting out? Numb, numb. Alec de to uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, who... Uh, had some very astute observations in an earlier period of American history said this, he who has set his heart exclusively upon the pursuit of wealthy, worldly welfare is always in a hurry for he has but a limited time at his disposal to reach, to grasp, and to enjoy it. And I think that sums up modern life, reaching and grasping to enjoy. But there's never enough time for it because we're always pushing ourselves so hard. 
Anytime you see life flourishing, it's because it's receiving nourishment from outside of itself. What are you relying on to nourish yourself in the public place? Jeremiah warns, in the book of Jeremiah, warns against trying to nourish ourselves from the wrong things. He says this, this is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws his strength from mere flesh. Now this is interesting because what pressure in the public place does is it makes us stretch for roots in the secret place. It makes us go down. That's what happens when a drought comes onto a tree. It begins to reach for something from the soil to nourish it itself. And God says, cursed is the person who when stress, pressure comes, draws nourishment from mere flesh. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. Why not? You wanna know why? Because they're so burned out trying to maintain themselves. The amount of people you meet who have remarkable amounts of money and privilege, but their relationships are thin. Their children don't like them. They're strained. They've got very few friends. Working so hard, and when you get it, it's thin. Can't even enjoy it when it shows up. They will dwell in parched places of the wilderness in a salt land where no one lives. Now, what Jeremiah is actually referring to is a, a place that was actually... In Israel, the land that lies to the southwest of the Sea of Galilee is very, very dry. The soil is rocky and dusty. Nothing lives there unless farmers irrigate it or there are summer rains where some rain comes in and then you have these little pools that spring up. And for as long as they can last in the heat, things will flourish. But as soon as the heat is too much, it disappears. The curse of modern culture. Herman Bavink says this, the more abundantly the benefits of civilization come streaming our way, the emptier our lives become. With all its wealth and power, it only shows that the human heart in which God has put eternity is so huge that all the world is too small to satisfy it. All the world is too small. That's the curse of modern culture. Like a little bush, the term that's used here, a raw bush, it comes from the Hebrew word for naked because it was a twisted, small, stunted, ugly bush. It couldn't thrive in the desert. Shallow and temporary sources of life. This is like the second soil we read about. Jesus says there's some people who hear the good news, but they have no roots. And so it just goes mad at first. But when things get hard, because it can't go down beyond the rocky ledge, it wilts when it gets hard. And this is a great test because if you only flourish because of your group, and you lose your group and your faith with us. You didn't have faith in Jesus, you had faith in Christian friendships. If the pastor leaves and your faith leaves, you trusted a celebrity, you didn't trust God. What are we rooted in? What is that? What are we going down into? I don't know about you, I do not want to be shallow and small and struggling in the wilderness of Western culture. Well, there's another place that we can learn. It's not the public place. It's a secret place. Look what goes on in Jeremiah. So blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. They'll be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and it never fails to bear fruit. Now, Jeremiah scholars think is referring to an actual place. Let's pull a picture of it up. It's called Gan Hashlosha. It's an absolutely beautiful place in the middle of the wilderness, garden of the three springs. The pools and waterfalls in the garden are filled with deep, cool, emerald blue water, refreshed by underground springs. People come from all over the region to refresh themselves in it. It's extraordinary. And so this is not dependent on what's happening above it. It's fed underneath from a secret place. Rabbis believe, one of their traditions, that this was the Garden of Eden. What a picture. A small bush in the wilderness that cannot grow as compared to this beautiful, lush forest springing up. Now listen, I want to tell you something right now. Here's my vision for you. My vision for you is that this is what your spirit looks like. That in the middle of the wasteland of spirituality and pressure that is our modern world, you would have an inner source of life 
that regardless of the season that you're in, regardless of the circumstances you were facing, you would be able to draw on something that is within you because of the life of God. Have you ever met someone like that? You just meet these people. It's got nothing to do with their education or how much money they have. And they're just drawing from something deeper and different than everyone around them. You know what happens? People are drawn to them. What is that? That's my heart for you. Look, you can, you can be a college student and have more life within you than the well-educated professor trying to teach you how to live. You can be an administrative assistant at a hedge fund and have more life in you than the partner sitting around the table. It's about learning to access the secret place that we have. So this is what I want to talk about. So we're in a series called The Jesus Stuff. And I want to ask a simple, so last week, Susie, Pastor Susie talked about how the Holy Spirit empowered Jesus. But I want to ask the question, how did Jesus go get that power? How did Jesus go get that power? That's the secret of the secret place. Bob Sorge has a beautiful book called The Secrets of the Secret Place. Yeah? Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 tells us something startling. And here's what he says. If you want to know a place where wherever you step in there, your spirit will be strengthened, your hope will be lifted, grace will be shown you for your sin, discouragement will be met with mercy, and God is always there. If I told you there was a place where you could get that whenever you wanted, how many of you would change your plans and, and, and spend a little time there? Three of you. Okay, I'll get some preaching to do. Let me try again. How many of you? Seven of you. I'm here all night, folks. I will keep on preaching. <laughs> Got to find the secrets of the secret place. There's three things. So here's what I want you to say. Jesus in this passage would often withdraw and get to the secret place. The way that Jesus was able to sustain his mission, break the fear of man, Perform signs and wonders. All of this came from time in the secret place. The key to power and authority and security in your life is how much time you spend in the secret place. Three things happen in the secret place. We see in the life of Jesus. Number one, his identity is cemented and secured in the secret place. In our modern world today, it, 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 constructing an identity or a sense of self is very complex. Uh, the, the reason that our culture says this, like you get to define yourself and invent an identity and the rest of the world exists to affirm that identity. Do you know how terrible that advice is? Even elementary psychology, someone like Freud says, we don't even know who's going to show up. We don't know if this is your authentic self. We don't know if this is your like immature, grasping, ego-driven self. We don't know if this is like your wise, mature self that's going to think long-ranging. We never know on any given day who's going to show up. And so to simply say, do what's in your heart is to simply say, do whatever you feel in the moment and you cannot build a society or a life on that because it'll be fragile and external. And here's what you require. If you choose an identity and you have to perform your identity, you will need thousands of points of validation to keep your identity intact. And as soon as come, someone comes along and says, I don't think that's who you are, you, you will literally have a conniption. How dare you? Well, I dare, what are you going to do about it? And you're just going to collapse inward. It's exhausting to perform an identity. It's even more exhausting to perform them over the course of a lifetime. Here's the key. It's receiving an identity. Who God says you are is better than who you can make up who you think you are. And you've got to get in touch with that. I love, love Henry Nouwen, and he wrote a beautiful book called The Way of the Heart. I'm about to drop an extended quote on you, and I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a little nervous based on my previous interactions with the room. <laughs> but it's good. So you've got a risk in every sermon. Here's my risk. Henry Nouwen on the interior life. Listen to what he says. Solitude is the furnace of transformation. Without solitude, we remain victims of our society and continue to be entangled in the illusions of the false self. Jesus himself entered into this furnace. There he was tempted with the three compulsions of the world. To be relevant, turn stones into loaves. To be spectacular, throw yourself down. And to be powerful, I will give you all these kingdoms. There he affirmed God as the only source of his identity. You must worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. Listen, 
Solitude is the place of the great struggle and the great encounter. The struggle against the compulsions of the false self and the encounter with a loving God who offers himself as the substance of the new self. Do you see that? Under stress, who am I? You draw down and you don't find shaky uh, cultural identities. You find the substance of the love and life of God himself as the foundation of who you truly are. That's where you got to get in the secret place. Every time Jesus, every time the scriptures tell us that you can hear what's happening in the secret place, here's what it is. It's the father saying, this is my son, I love him. This is my son, listen to him. This is my son, I love him. The voice of heaven is in a voice of affirmation. And when we step in, that's what we hear too. I I love, my my favorite gospel is the gospel of John. The other ones are strong, but John's the strongest. And I I wanna tell you why, I wanna tell you why. The gospel of John starts, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The gospel of John starts with Jesus in the heart of the Father. But the Gospel of John ends with John resting his head on Jesus' chest. It goes from the intimacy of the Trinity to the intimacy of communion with Christ himself. Now, John got to write a Gospel, which means I guess he could take sort of like some creative uh, liberties with it. And cheekily enough, he called himself the one that Jesus loved. (laughs) And this is an extraordinary moment because... At the Last Supper, here you've got, uh, it's just like, it's, it's, the, the, it's the gang, it's everything you expect. A dispute uh, breaks out amongst them as to which one is going to be considered the greatest. Peter is like, Jesus says, I've got to wash your feet. And he goes, you'll never wash my feet, Lord. And Jesus says, if I don't wash you, you can't have a part of me. And he's like, honestly, Jesus, sponge bathe me, like wash all. And he's like, look, 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 I've, you're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. And then here you have this one scene where John is resting his head on Jesus' chest. Here's here's what we know. I want you to see this. All the other disciples ran, but John stayed. John went to the cross. He was the one that that could make it through the chaos and the crisis. Why? Because he knew, in spite of everything, he wasn't just an apostle to do things for God. He was the one chosen by God. He was the one that Jesus loved. And we have to step into the secret place and hear that for ourselves. Second thing we see that happened is that in the secret place, Jesus finds a kind of strength. And anytime you get to the secret place, you're going to find staggering strength. Now, I want to just, let me just pause for a minute here. Some of you are trying to dismiss what I'm saying as like Pentecostal rah-rah. You know, like, well, man, you know, like if you whip yourself up, you're going to like shift your psychological state. That's going to give you a little bit of a buzz to sort of overcome for a minute, but it doesn't work in real life. That, that's not what we're saying at all. It's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about real strength to handle the most difficult crises on earth. David's whole life, David's leading a kingdom. David had more influence and power than you and I will ever have. David faced staggering crises in his life. There's one moment when he's off fighting and his, the, his enemies, the Amalekites, come, steal his wife and children. And everybody's getting ready to kill him. And he has to step back and it says, David strengthened himself in the Lord. He goes to the secret place. His secret counsel, should we go get them? Yes. And he's able to recover what was lost because he had a pathway near the presence of God under stress. So, so uh, just have a listen to this. This is Psalm 3. Have you, how many of you guys love Psalm 3? Personal favorite, yeah. Look, have you ever noticed the title of Psalm 3? A psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. So David's son is trying to take over the kingdom, rebel against him, raise up an army and remove David, his father, from his throne. Would you call that like a family dynamic? That's real. That's real pressure. Look what it says. Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying God will not deliver him, but you, Lord, are a great shield around me. My glory, the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. This is not a sentimental psalm for when you're having problems at work with a coworker. This is when your son's at war with you seeking to steal your kingdom and he is accessing peace in the presence of God that enables him to sleep in the middle of impossible circumstances. He says, I will not fear though tens of thousands assail me on every side. Arise, O Lord, deliver me. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be upon your people. Psalm 27, 
of David, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? He's gonna go on and tell you of whom he should be afraid. When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, yet I will be confident. Do you have that sort of spirit in you from being in the secret place? I had a little tiff with my coworker and I'm having a meltdown. As opposed to, though war break out against me, yet will I be confident. David's not trusting in himself. This is a prayer to God. He is reaching up and pulling down the access he has as a covenant member of Yahweh's community and asking for his deliverance. See, what, what we get is courage in the midst of the chaos that we are facing. Listen, I want, let me say this to you. It could be true that the secret place could also be called the ugly place. You got an ugly cry sometimes. I'm totally serious. I'm not talking. Thou thankest thou thine Lord God. Batter thine heart, thy thrust. Uh, listen, I'm, I'm, sometimes you got to get in there and you got to wrestle it out. Remember the key to the book of Job? All of Job's friends talked about God. Job talked to God. He brought it to him and ultimately that's what brought God to show up. Who is this who darkens my counsel? And where's the friends? Gone and now it's an encounter with the Almighty. He's wrestling it out with God. And so sometimes you're gonna bring your, your, the hardest things of your life, your deepest pain, your heartache, your frustration. You gotta take all of that stuff and you gotta bring it to God, but He will give you strength. Look at what happened to Jesus. I love this quote from Haddon Robertson. Look at what he says. Where was it that Jesus sweat great drops of blood? Not in Pilate's hall, not on his way to Golgotha. It was in the garden of Gethsemane. There he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. Had I been there and witnessed that struggle, I would have worried about the future. If he is so broken up and all he is doing, praying, I might have said, what will he do when he faces a real crisis? Why can't he approach the ordeal with the calm confidence of his three sleeping friends? Yet when the test came, Jesus walked to the cross with courage and his three friends fell away, fell, fell apart and fell away. One of the ways the early church conquered the Roman Empire, the Romans loved a noble death. Like this is, a Roman soldier did not want to die like this. Ah, ah, uh, uh, they, that's like just bury him where, don't even bury him, let the birds get him. They didn't want a coward's death. And one of the things that struck them about the Christians is they'll have women and children and they'd send them into the, into the theaters. And they're gonna be martyrs for their faith and they'd put animal skins on children and women and throw them to the lions. And these children and their women would stand firm. You read the accounts of the martyrs and the Romans would simply say, where did they get power to die like that? They simply, in the most horrific circumstances that you can ever comprehend, had a kind of power from wrestling with God in the secret place that enabled them to prosper in the public place. They, they drew on something deep. This morning, women leaders of the church in Iran woke up and they risked being gang raped if they were caught losing all of their possessions. But the women woke up this morning and they wrestled with God in the secret place. They said, Jesus is worth it. We're gonna make disciples no matter what it costs us. Where do we get resolve like this? You only get that in the secret place. So I wanna be clear here. I'm not talking about stepping in and the Disney birds sing like a theme song of self-empowerment. I'm talking about the reality of the kingdom of God breaking in and giving you impossible power to face the situations you were dealing with. Friends, can I give you a, a line here? And I want you to take this in the spirit. You need to get to the secret place. You need to get to the secret place. The solutions in your business are not gonna be found with more and more strategy. I love strategy, it's in my top five gifts, but I wanna tell you the solutions are in the secret place. Some of you are desperately lonely, aching. Where am I gonna find this person? And I'm, I'm all for all the ways that you find godly people. But I wanna tell you, the healing of your heart is not found on a dating app. It's found in the secret place. You gotta to get to the secret place. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need to get to the secret place. Turn to your other neighbor and tell them, you need to get to the secret place. 
Here's why. Power in the public place comes from strength in the secret place. You need to get to the secret place. Now, the secret place is where you go to meet with God. It's where you go to pour out your heart. It's where you go to secure identity. It's where you go to get strength to do the impossible. So here's a question. How often should you get to the secret place? Well, here's the answer. Often. You should get there often. Look, here's, here's, here's what it says. Jesus often withdrew to solitary places and prayed. You gotta have a rhythm where what happens in the secret place will sustain what happens in the public place. You gotta get enough from there to get you here. Because if not, the weight of this will cause you to collapse. Look at, look, at, look at Jesus' rhythm. Mark 1, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. The teaching text tonight, Luke 5, news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often, but Jesus often. strengthen your servant's frame, Lord God. Jesus often withdrew to solitary places and prayed. Luke 9, about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and he went up to a mountain to pray. Matthew 14, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up into the mountain side by himself to pray. Luke 6, 12, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and he spent the night praying to God. Matthew 26, Jesus went with his disciples to the place called Gethsemane and he said to them, sit there while I go over here and pray. One of the, so one of the things I wanna say is this, how did Jesus nourish himself so he could prosper in the public place? He, he got alone, he went to the secret place. You're like, yeah, but he's Jesus. No, 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 that's the wrong answer this one time. That's the wrong answer. Because what Jesus is showing us, that even though he is God incarnate, he needed to get to the secret place to receive power from his Father. And if Jesus, who was God on earth, needed power from the secret place, can I just say you might need a little help along your way. Here's Jesus' rhythm, okay? Let's get this chart up. Here's Jesus' rhythm, okay? This is after rhythms of renewal. I'm skipping some. Calling. Withdrawal, power. Calling, withdrawal, power. Jesus was not running on worldly ambition, trying to build a name for himself. Jesus was living out of divine calling. Jesus knew that that calling required power, so he would separate himself to be with the Father. He would receive power and he would get back to his calling. If Jesus did this, you need to do this. Calling, withdrawal, power. Calling, withdrawal, power. The reason this is important is because if we don't have a sacred rhythm, we will be swallowed whole by the secular ones. These are what Thomas Merton called social compulsions. And a social compulsion means that you are literally triggered by the behavior of everybody else to, to do certain things that society requires of you without even ever really asking, is this my call, is this God's will? I feel like we've made some progress in this sermon, so I'm gonna give you another long quote from Henry Nowen. <laughs> Secularity is a way of being dependent on the responses of our milieu. The secular or false self is the self which is fabricated, as Thomas Merton says, by social compulsions. Compulsive is indeed the best adjective for the false self. It points to the need for ongoing and increasing affirmation. Who am I? Am I the one who is liked, praised, admired, disliked, hated, or despised? Whether I am a pianist, a businessman, or a minister, what matters is how I am perceived by my world. If being busy is a good thing, then I must be busy. If having money is a sign of real freedom, then I must claim my money. If knowing many people proves my importance, I will have to make the necessary contacts. The compulsion manifests itself in the lurking fear of failure and the steady urge to prevent this by gathering more of the same. More work, more money, more friends. Free from social compulsions. Jesus was completely free from the fear of man and the demands of the crowd. If you don't have rhythms of renewal, you will seek exits of escape. 
I don't, I don't know how to tell you this. Rest is coming for you. You can choose it or you will have to take it. But rest is coming for you. Aquinas says this man cannot live without joy. That's why one deprived of spiritual joys goes over to carnal pleasures. We've got to be free from the social compulsions by delighting ourselves in the beauty and wonder of the secret place. Friends, can I say to you again, get to the secret place often. Get to the secret place often. Power in the public place comes from strength in the secret place. Look at what it says here, Psalm 32, verses six through eight. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. These are the metaphors the psalmists are using. Do you remember when you were a kid? Did you play hide and seek and used to love to hide? I I was like, like, I don't wanna be too overconfident here, but I did have a little bit of a black belt in my childhood of playing hide and seek. I was very hard to find. And the key, no, no, I'm serious. The key, the key to my hiddenness was my ability to climb stuff. I just would climb stuff, just places where you go, no one would ever hide up there. And I was like, oh yeah, nobody. I remember once I was like five, like literally doing a Spider-Man, pressing my feet against my back in an arch and everybody was walking underneath me trying to find me and I was like I can do this all night long (laughs) whenever a scandal hits the first thing people do is they try and hide there's something beautiful about being able to hide where you know no one can find you he says you are my hiding place he says you protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance What a beautiful vision. Yes, when we set into the presence of God, we're singing holy, holy, holy. Yes, when we see his glory, we're singing you're beautiful, but also he is singing over us. I love you, I want you, you're welcome here. Here's what God's word says. It says we can come into the the throne of grace with freedom and confidence. One of the great goals I had in parenting my children, they're both adults now. I wanted my children to understand how much I was for them and committed to them. And my goal was to have such an intimacy they would bring me their sin to process together rather than hide it in shame. And I I try to say to my son, who did have a little moment where he tried to hide some stuff in shame, and I was like, listen, mate, what do I have to do for you to understand that I am for you, bring it to me. So you're driving along in your car and all your friends are smoking weed and the police pull you over. You don't need to think I'm gonna get killed. You need to think I need to call my dad. My dad can help me with this situation. You need to view me as an advocate who is here for you. My dad can help with this. You get stuck somewhere and it's a disaster. I'm gonna call my dad. My dad can help me with this. It doesn't mean there won't be consequences. Life is filled with consequences. It just means I am for you to walk you through these things and to bring you into your future. Now, as I'm trying to get my kids to understand this, here's what I feel God say to me, then why are you hiding your sin from me? Bring it to me. Bring it to me. This is what God wants. Listen, there's a, if you sense condemnation telling you you can't bring this to God, that is the voice of the enemy in your life. Satan has one primary goal for your life and it's to stop you getting to the secret place. And he doesn't care how he does it. It can be silly distractions or major sin or too much time at work or trivial little things in your life. The strategy doesn't matter as long as the goal is the same. Separate them from the place of power and deliverance and confidence and security. And so I wanna say to you tonight, you need to get to the secret place. You gotta get there to find the life that you need. John Ortberg says this, the story of the Bible isn't primarily about the desire of people to be with God. It is the desire of God to be with His people. Listen, God's not gonna be disappointed if you bring your sin to Him. What else are you gonna do? Try and clean the mess up yourself? Come and get mercy. Maybe you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus 
and you're not quite sure how you got here, I'm glad you're here. And here's what you're realizing about your life right now. You're realizing that you're trying to nourish yourself with yourself self, and so that you don't have what it takes to be your own God. And you've committed sins and you've sin, sin says you've done something wrong that separates you from God. God, it means you've fallen short of His glory. That means there's a person you're meant to be that is beautiful and noble, but you can't ever quite actualize it because you've fallen short of that glory because of your sin. You're separated from God and the only way that you're gonna be truly healed and satisfied and filled is you get out of trying to perform for the world and you come into the mercy and the grace of the secret place. The secret place can be found anywhere. Jesus found the secret place, drawing on the sand and a woman got another start at life. Jesus made a secret place at a well so a woman could have eternal life. Jesus went to uh, Zacchaeus' house and over a little bit of lunch, secret place broke out, deliverance broke out. It's extraordinary. So I want to say tonight, if you have not given your life to Jesus, you can get to the secret place and find life tonight. Now, some of you are here and you're like, oh, John, look, I, I like this like I do. I appreciate it. Sorry for not being more affirmative earlier in the talk, but I was, okay. But you're busy. Dad, look, this doesn't work in New York. Oh, Yeah like the great missionaries and martyrs of history couldn't make the secret place work for their lives. Look, Susanna Wesley, raising like more kids in your, more kids in four families that you know are going to have. She's raising them herself. Her husband's taken off to prison. She got no time. She's got kids everywhere, breastfeeding. She's doing breastfeeding, toddlers, educating and dealing with older kids. It's like she had quite a bit going on. You know, the only place she could get to the secret place was to put an apron over her head. And the kids were like, oh, mom's in the secret place. And she's a little cranky if you come try get her before she's ready coming out with that Pentecostal power. <laughs> Leave the apron on mom's head. And you know what happened? She raised up the number one worship leader of her generation and the number one revivalist by finding time under an apron at a table in a busy house. Don't tell me you can't get to the secret place. Hudson Taylor wrote a beautiful book. So Hudson Taylor, or someone wrote it about it. Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret. The big question, here was the question people wanted to know. Hudson Taylor, if you don't know who he is, was he founded the China Inland Mission. He just saw a whole nation without a witness of the gospel and said, somebody's got to do something about it. And he went, lived an extraordinary life, worked morning to evening. Nobody really saw him spend time with God. And they kept asking the question, where does he get the power? His daughter tells this story. They were in this inn in China and they would just sleep on mats on the floor. And uh, one morning she said, I saw my father at 2 a.m. wake up, set, just get a little light and set his Bible on a little table in the corner and spend two hours abiding in the love of Jesus in the middle of the night. And she said this, that was Hudson Taylor's secret. Power in the middle of the night. Listen, I believe in sleep. It's my number one goal in my 40s is more sleep. But I wanna tell you, there are three things I will give up sleep for. Number one is to try and exercise because it mitigates the offset, which I need to do more. Number two, number two, I'll do it for love. I will sacrifice sleep for love, but number three, I'll sacrifice for the secret place. And I would rather be tired and walk with Jesus than sleep like a baby and live in the flesh. And it's, listen, I'm not, I, listen, I'm not calling you to do dumb stuff, but I am calling you to do desperate stuff for the kingdom of God. We gotta be hungry. We gotta get to the secret place. We've got to do it daily. You've got to do it weekly. I just came off a beautiful Sabbath yesterday. Frolicking around in resplendent full glory, pleasure stacking. How was your day? I sometimes see, Jew I think Jewish people see me doing the Sabbath and they're like, oh, you've upgraded it. Like seriously, I like the way you do that. And then seasonally, You've got to figure out what season you're in and how much of the presence of God. Sometimes you're in seasons where you can, you can abide and honestly, 20, 30 minutes with a gospel reading and something from the Psalms and stilling your hearts before the presence of Christ is enough. And there's other seasons where if you try and take that into battle, you're going to get taken out the first shot. You need prayer, fasting, power, pressing in. Different seasons for everybody, but here's what I know. You've got to get to the secret place. The Jesus stuff in Jesus' life came from His willingness to withdraw and get to the secret place. And if you want more of the Jesus stuff, you need to get more of the secret place.
You can come before God with freedom and confidence because of the blood of Jesus. When you walk in, you're not annoying God like He's a busy dad who doesn't have time for you. When you walk in, He's like, that's what I'm talking about. Bring me your sin. That's what I'm talking about. You're beat down. Let me cement your identity. You need wisdom and power. Let me give you insight and revelation. Some of you are like, this stuff doesn't work in the real world. Let me tell you, nations, the Berlin Wall and communism fell because enough people got into the secret place and God released enough power in the public place and communism ended. Read the stories about the praying Christians. What's happening in the underground church right now is absolutely extraordinary. The Chinese government has a problem because of underground Christianity. This stuff works in the real world and it'll work in your world. You gotta get to the secret place. So can we just take a moment tonight and just sort of reset our hearts? And can we, Jesus says this, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I'm gentle and lowly in heart. I wanna promise you right now, Manhattan is a harsh master. Jesus is a gentle saviour. Yoke yourself to the right thing. Yoke yourself. Learn the rhythms of grace from Jesus. Learn how to get power from heaven to endure any impossible situation from Jesus. Wives, your husband needs you to get to the secret place. Husbands, your wife called. She says, you need to get to the secret place. My wife called and was like, honey, before I come home from my Disney cruise, I need you to get to the secret place. And if we're gonna be the church that Jesus calls us to be in this city, what are we gonna power it on? We can't even get proper buildings. We're relying on our strategy. You think we're gonna get cashed up? Just go buy a building. The building we need minimum is 100 million. Listen, here's what I believe. If we're a church that seeks first the kingdom and lives out of the power of the secret place, He will act on our behalf. The secret place. We need to be a church given to the secret place. The reason we have four hours of prayer a day in this room, you wanna know why? Because we believe God can do more in four hours than 40 years if we are committed to seeking His power in the secret place. So I wanna ask you right now, if you'd just be willing just to bow your head. I'm not gonna do anything weird here. But I want us, can we just say to God, Lord, I need you. Lord, I'm just confessing I need you. Why don't you just right now just say, Lord, I wanna just ask that you show me the rhythm I need for the season I'm in. Maybe you need to ask God for forgiveness. Lord, this, I haven't been coming to the secret place because... I've been hiding my sin. Bring your sin to Jesus. Maybe you're burned out and exhausted. Why don't you just let Him love you? There is nothing you have done that can separate you from God's love. He will not love you any more if you're really good and He will not love you any less if you're not. When you were God's enemy, Jesus died for you. Come to the secret place. Father, we just wanna to say to you tonight as we lay our hearts before you, we wanna say we need you, Lord. Forgive us for thinking we can live the Christian life without Christ. Forgive us for settling for less. Lord, we wanna be like Jesus. We wanna be free from the fear of this city. Lord, we wanna have strength to endure the impossible. Lord, we wanna have courage Lord, we wanna be so filled with your love that when this culture crucifies us, we don't get in a giant war and fight with it. We simply say, Father, forgive it. It doesn't know what it's doing. It doesn't have access to the secret place right now. So Lord, would you just forgive us for our independence and self-reliance and teach us the rhythms of renewal. 
Lord, forgive us for just, for just bowing to the hustle and the grind. Forgive us for ungodly drive. Forgive us for worldly ambition and stir within us delight in your presence. Father, I pray that each one of us will be able to say, even tonight as we rest our head on you, that as we write our story, when we talk about ourselves, we describe ourselves as the one that Jesus loves. So Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you will come and you will draw us deeper into the heart of Jesus. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Lord, I pray these words spoken by leaders trusting in you in hard circumstances will be the words in our lips that cry of our heart in our city tonight. And we just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would meet us here and that you would give us power from the secret place. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, I want to invite you to stand tonight. We're just going to close by responding. And I, want to, I just want to say to you tonight, we've got a prayer team here down the front. And if you need prayer for anything in particular, and uh, maybe there's something heavy on your heart, maybe you've got something coming up this week, maybe you've got a decision you need to make and it requires like biblical courage in order to do it. And you just want somebody to pray for you. These folks would love to be able to pray for you. Uh, if you've never given your life to Jesus and you realize tonight that you do not have enough within yourself to nourish yourself and you wanna flourish because you receive the life of God in the heart of the human soul, we'd love to be able to pray for you as well. So while we're worshiping, if the Holy Spirit touches your heart, uh, I wanna encourage you to come forward. And the rest of us, some of you are like, I gotta get going. To, to where? <laughs> Stay for the song. Stay for the song, press in, press in. This morning, people gave their lives to Jesus. This morning, people received prophetic words that set them free and wept in wonder that God knew them so personally. This morning, God's pouring out His Spirit. Be in the room, imagine being a secondhand Pentecost hearer. Bro, there was fire in my head, stop it. No, there was, I saw, imagine. Let's stay tonight and let's press in. Let's make this on 57th Street in the middle of New York City, 57th and night, this can be a secret place. Let's press in.